Let's get it. Yo, 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 what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Affiliate Marketing Show. I'm your host, Josh from OfferVault.com, the industry's largest aggregator of all things affiliate marketing. We also have Mr. Paper Call, Adam Young, the industry legend, Harrison Gewurz, as well as our special guest today, Miguel Chavez, COO of Ecomfy Lead, one of the world's leading media buying performance-based advertising groups that specializes in connecting high-quality leads through social media paid ads. What is up, Miguel? How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thanks. Thanks for the invite, guys. It's an honor to be here with all of you, and hopefully we get to discuss uh, great things together. Yeah, you know, I think Harrison was feeling a little jealous of your sunglasses. What's going on, Harrison? I, I was feeling excluded that I was not wearing sunglasses when I saw Miguel just looking so handsome in his yellow sunglasses. So I had to scavenge through my backpack to grab these old, these old glass, these old shades, shall we say. <laughs> Adam, Adam, where are your ye yellow sunglasses? You're muted, Adam. Adam, you're muted, boy. I'm too old for this shit, boys. No sunglasses <laughs> inside for me. <laughs> So this is a coincidence, but this is the second episode in a row where we've had our special guest go from being a doctor to an internet marketer. Uh, I'm curious, Miguel, I saw on LinkedIn, you used to be a dentist. How does, a, uh, how does one go from being a dentist to the CEO, COO of eComfy Lead? And I think the question kind of comes from, you know, a lot of people, especially in our industry, I think are always striving for more, trying to figure out what's next. Um, so I'm curious, like when you were a dentist, were you just like, this isn't working for me or you found out that wasn't your passion? Like, how did you end up going that route? I found out that it was my, it wasn't my passion at all. I pretty much went to dentistry school because my parents wanted me to, to, you know, to have a degree in my family. Either you were a lawyer or either were you a doctor. Otherwise you're kind of like a failure. So <laughs> I had to go through school, just, you know, like give them. Uh, the degree and after I started working uh, as a dentist I found myself you know like making a decent amount of money but at the same time I was like miserable you know like I didn't have the time to enjoy with my loved ones uh, I was working Monday to Sunday and, and yeah I did have the money but I couldn't you know like do anything good with it and I mean and one of the parts that I enjoy I love the most of, of being a dentist is like helping people and you know like giving uh, smiles back to the world, but it's also a job that requires uh, a lot of sacrifice, and and your your body takes a toll because you are you're getting like all the toxins and different stuff. That I mean, I just I was like uh, 25 years old, and I wanted to change, you know, like the type of lifestyle that I was having, and and that's how I started, you know, like looking into all the internet marketing stuff and like how to run ads on on Facebook and and what was the e-commerce at that point. And, and when I had kind of like that uh, that breakthrough moment in my life, I met my business partner who was doing great numbers on Shopify. And he was like, hey, dude, I'm doing like 100K days. Like, it's like, I'm, I'm not living the best of my life. I'm like, holy shit, I don't believe it. So pretty much he pulled off his phone and like showed me how he was doing it. And and that was it. Like, I, I got in love on like, the media, the media buying and, and, you know, like running ads and pretty much he taught me, uh, we started running some econ products that were able to scale. And then from there on, we just transitioned into lead gen and nowadays pay per call. Well, it seems the transition's working out for you. I see the, uh, Ringba goat award over your shoulder there. When did you receive that? And, uh, tell us a little bit about that experience. Yeah, um, I received it uh, early this year. I believe we, we got to, to the amount uh, by end of, of last year. Uh, we have been focusing a lot on, on the dev space. Uh, that has been kind of like our, our golden nugget there or, or the very goal that we found out that is working best for us. Um, I mean, I didn't know anything about uh, paper call at all. I, I mean, I started running paper call last year 
Uh, I bought Carlos Corona Mastermind, and then I met Adam and, and Harrison over one mastermind that Carlos threw down here in Miami. And I just got in love on, on the on the game of the paper gold side and 100% I believe with, you know, like all the regulations that are coming into place that paper gold is going to be uh, the, the present future that, that we all got, you know? And yeah. Well, Miguel, I think I can tell you nothing makes Adam and Harrison happier to hear someone say that paper call is the future. There's a huge smile on Adam's face right now. I want to talk about uh, media buying a little bit. I know you guys, you know, focus a lot in that area of the industry. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about like the current state of media buying in the affiliate industry? And then from there, we can dive into the specifics a little bit. Sure. Um, I'll say, I mean, well, what we have been doing is mostly uh, social media. Uh, we run different platforms like Meta, TikTok, YouTube. Um, each one of them is like a whole different algorithm and a whole different world uh, where you need to, you know, like talk, like sign it up and, and get your team to develop all the skills that they need in order to succeed in all of those platforms. Um, we have put in like a lot of emphasis in the AI personalization on our landers and everything that we're using, just trying to take leverage of all the AI tools that, that we now have our disposition. Um, and also, I mean, we have been seeing uh, kind of like there's a lot of misleading marketing that kind of like we in the in the performance space kind of used to it. But some of the things that we have been working here is just being creative and and using like real advertising, right? Like not just like telling people uh, a ton of crazy stuff and then that they're not going to end up being like real customers. So. Right now, we're focusing in creating that relationship with the customers um, that goes into telling the customer the reality of, of the product itself and, and how they can get help, you know? Yeah, 100%. I want to dive into the social media stuff when it comes to paid ads. Um, can you tell us a little bit about like what you find works the best when it comes to doing paid ads on social media? What platforms you find yield the best results and return on the ad sped. And then, you know, also what specific like tips and tricks related to the creatives actually help the ad perform better, like color, these, this word here, this type of graphic, like all that kind of stuff, you know, things that people watching can actually take away and apply to their own marketing efforts. Sure. Uh, I mean, each platform is a, a totally different word. Uh, each platform has its own way of working and and pretty much each media value that puts him, himself through a different platform is kind of like they have to wear different hats because uh, each platform works totally different. For us, uh, on ROI-wise, the platform that has given us the best ROI is TikTok. Uh, TikTok is like a monster that one day you are like 1,000% ROI and the next day you are just losing so much money. Luckily, uh, all my media buyers are like super young guys, like Gen Z, most of them, and they just got to understand the, the TikTok algorithm. Um, regarding videos or like how, like what are the content or the creative that we use to, you know, like to grab people's attention is mostly user-generated content, like behind myself, uh, it's like that door is like where our content creation team uh, works. Um, we do create a lot of videos per week. Uh, at this moment, we're generating around 100 videos per week just to test new videos, new ideas, new hooks. Uh, but the reality is that most of the videos are super user-generating content, something that doesn't look like an ad at all. It's just, you know, like someone yeah. giving the testimonial on how, on how the thing works. I feel like sometimes when people are starting it out on, on this industry, they want to make, you know, like the best ad or the best video and we have seen that the the videos that you know like have the the less set up or just, just like organic uh they used to like they perform much better uh and now we're also using images but our strongest videos user generated content and we just you know like use our office uh, you know like as a studio to uh, record all those videos on a weekly basis and i'm curious to run because I'm, I've never bought any media on TikTok. I stopped buying media before TikTok existed. 
how many creatives do you need to do to find a winner? And then how long will a creative last before it's burnt out? I guess what I'm trying to understand is like, how much content and how many creatives are you really having to make to sustain an ongoing campaign? Yeah, uh, out of the 100 videos that, that we generate every single week, we found out that 20 to 25% are, are the winning ones. And that's why like we're also like so focused on creating the quality of the video, but also the quantity of the video, because sometimes like you can do like a little like change on, on the video, maybe at the beginning or maybe at the, or maybe at the end. And then the algorithm sees this as a new video. Uh, the creatives are like, they last like a week or so, because like I said, one day you can have like great ROI, but the next day it's just like dips and it's kind of like rinse and repeat. Also in our industry, we have, you know, a lot of people that, I mean, they don't, sometimes they don't want to, you know, like do the job on the creative side. So they just start taking, they just start taking up like your videos. And that's pretty much when, you know, like the performance of the video start dipping. Um, now with, you know, like all the connections that we have with these platforms, it helps us, you know, like to uh, save our videos and make sure that nobody else is using it. But it's pretty much it's a reality in our industry. So that's why we're constantly creating 100 videos a week. Out of those 100 videos, 25% are going to stick to the wall per se. And, and from there, it's just rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat every single week. You know, what I think is interesting about what Miguel is saying, Josh, is that nothing has really changed since Harrison and I were media buying a decade ago. We didn't do it on TikTok. We did it on Facebook. We did it on Native. We did it on all these little traffic platforms that used to exist. There used to be hundreds of them. And the game was essentially the same. We would create hundreds, if not thousands, of variations of landing pages and creatives and test them until we found one that won. Eventually, the affiliates would start stealing our creatives and our landing pages. That would burn out the creatives and the landing pages. We'd have to do Worst. all sorts of stuff <laughs> to report them to ad networks, DMCA takedowns, like all sorts of things to defend the creatives that we made because we had a content team. We would create our own creatives. We had people in the United States, people overseas. We do a lot of images, a lot of videos. There were a lot more images back in the day. And we would just go through thousands of these things to find winners. And so I think it's really interesting that your creative process was essentially our creative process, which is that it was a volume based process. You would just test, 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 test minor variations until you find a winner. And then once you have a winner, you take that and then create slightly different versions of the winner to see which one gets you the extra half a point or 1% higher interaction or, or whatever it is. So when, we talk to affiliates in the space today. They never want to do this amount of work. They never want to go through the process of doing thousands of creatives. But I think the reality is back then when Harrison and I did it and today, if you want to run a seven or eight or nine figure media buying shop, it is dependent on a lot of different things. But the place you really have to start is how are you going to produce quality and quantity of creatives to figure out what each uh, segment you're targeting is actually going to react to. Question for Adam. Oh, you can go uh, ahead. I want to add something real quick because this is something that I put like in the mind of my media buyers and also on the creative team because uh, a problem that I see with you know, like, uh, all of our friends that you know, like, also have teams of media buyers and also have teams of creatives. And that's a problem that you know, I talk to different people. It's like I found the same problem. The problem is, is that the creative team is one team and they're like on their side. And the media buyer department is like on their side. And they should be like best friends, you know, for me. They have to have like this relationship where they share like metrics, what is working, what is not working. And you find like, I'm, like I was amazed because most of the teams, like they don't like each other. So the first thing that I like did is just like make sure that my editors and my art director is the best friends of all, all of my media buyers to make sure that it's like I always tell them, imagine that you have a Ferrari 
and you just want to like drive your Ferrari with a like a cheap gas, you know, like how like how it will perform. It, it won't perform like as as it should be. But if you're getting, you know, like the premium gasoline, that's your Ferrari that's just gonna, you know, like move ten times faster. So I see like the same way on, on the videos. If you wanna, you know, like have say six, seven figures or eight figures, a media buying team, you gotta have the best gas for them and that guy is gonna be the videos, you know. Hundred percent, Adam. I was going to ask. You talked about you know nothing has changed much since you guys were doing media buying, and it just popped into my head. Like, was there like paid social ads on MySpace back in the day, or did they? There were. Like, there were. Yeah. Okay. You're looking at their largest customer for the last year they were in existence. It was me. yeah. Hell yeah, dude. I ran ten MySpace ad accounts. I was doing all sorts of education leads uh, with various education companies. Monster Education at the time, they're no longer around. Uh, PMA Media Group, Chris Scanlon is still around. His, his brother, who I worked with, unfortunately, one of our good friends, Steve Scanlon, passed away a few years ago and is no longer with us. And it was amazing. Back then, it was only banner ads. We didn't have video. But essentially, what I had to do on a daily basis was across 10 different ad accounts, because they had creative limits in their ad accounts. You can only have so many creatives. Uh, across 10 different or maybe maybe it was even 15 different ad accounts, I was uploading hundreds of creatives a day and they were banner ads. And then at the end of the day, when they stopped performing or we got data back, I'd have to clean out all these ad accounts, delete all the non-working creatives and then upload hundreds more every day. And I had outsourced teams of people making these banners. They would send them to me. I was actually in my parents' basement uh, at the beginning of this adventure and then I would edit a lot of these Photoshop files myself, upload them. And then towards the very end, uh, Harrison and I were actually living together when I was running these campaigns with the MySpace folks. And it was really getting old in uh, 2010, I believe it was. And it was exactly the same, same thing. We were just smashing out as many creatives as possible to try and figure out which ones the users reacted to. And something that take some real learning in media buying is trying to remove your own bias from the creative. If you really love a creative or a landing page or whatever, you put your heart and soul into it, you invest a bunch of money into it, you like really go for an angle and then you run it and it flops, you just have to accept that you did it wrong and have to try it again. And the people who actually choose which creatives work are the viewers, not us. And so you really have to remove your emotional bias from anything you're doing and just really look at the results and what is resonating with people and then create ancillary uh, advertisements that go along with it. And what's really interesting is that, and I have this sitting next to me right here, is I wrote a book called The Paper oh, Call Revolution. It's nice. coming out in the next couple of weeks. And yeah, I want well, one of those. Yes, I will send you on or bring you on uh miguel but one thing i've been doing over the last couple of weeks is exactly what you've been talking about miguel i've been taking a copy of this book with me everywhere i go i've been doing lin uh doing advertisements and videos all over the place to try and come up with different ways uh that i can create ads and i told our team i just shipped out a couple of these books to other team members i told them that our goal is a thousand video ads for the launch oh, yeah. and they said adam you're crazy that's a lot and i said yeah it's a lot and we need a thousand like who's run a campaign like this how do you do it there aren't that many and so we just have to come up with all sorts of really creative ways to get people to engage with the book and so i've been doing this all week i've been throwing the book i've been uh you know tossing it in boxes and holding it up to a fireworks shows and taking videos around yachts over there in miami and just all sorts of crazy stuff right but i i think that to really get good at the creative process before i outsource this to my team i have to go do it myself so that i can show them unique examples of what i'm looking for and give them ideas they'll see it then they'll have their ideas i'll change my ideas and it it really is a creative back and forth process. And just like those MySpace days, I'm going to have to do thousands of creatives to really figure out which one resonates with 
my audience, which is different than Miguel's audience, and every campaign has its own audience, and every demographic group is going to respond differently to different things. So um, this it, it's like the creative process is really a labor of love, and if you're not going to invest in building a team of people and really doing uh, a lot of creative work, I don't think it's possible to build a really big, successful media buying company these days, Josh. That's a really sick book cover. I like that a lot, man. Yeah. Can you like say that. something? You got to say something so the camera goes on you. Yeah. You like that? <laughs> it's good. Hold on. Come it's to me, camera. Good. Come to me. Yeah. So <laughs> we had an artist do the book cover, and I've been working on this book for now uh, well over a year uh, with a professional author team and editing team. It was a huge investment of time and money, actually, writing a book. A really amazing book is no simple feat, but my goal is to get this in the hands of 100,000 people this year and expose them to paper call and really teach them about an opportunity where they can build a real business that has a sustainable future that they can sell one day. And, you know, I, I think, you know, my, my real goal with this is how many jobs can we create? How many people can we bring into the industry? How many opportunities can we create? Uh, and I'm very excited about putting out this material it 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 basically is the keys to pay per call and what i have learned over the last eight years on our journey evangelizing and growing the industry and building technology in it and all the stuff that i've seen so um i'm very excited about it and we'll do a free book giveaway josh once i have copies in hand for our viewers and my goal isn't isn't to profit off of this book. My goal is to take what I've learned, what's changed my life and changed so many of our customers' lives and give it back to the world so that we can create more opportunities for, for more people. So I know that resonates with you, Miguel, because we've talked about your journey a lot. And I think having that mission of, of helping others, like you said, is is really how we find success in the world. You know, there's I'm a big believer in rising tides lift all ships and that we can grow the size of the pie and it's it's fine like there's so much opportunity out there for people that if we just evangelize that opportunity it'll come back to us and and really help all of us so i'm super excited about this josh uh glad to debut the book on the pod <laughs> all we're saying looks looks pretty pretty good i really would like to take a uh a, a read because like i'm a long time reader and i really like to read a lot and i believe education is is one of the key things to bring success to people all around the world not only in the us and that has been my main focus you know like bringing opportunities to people all around the world doesn't matter where they are it doesn't matter the background doesn't matter you know like where they're coming from it's just like if you really want to have success if you want to have a successful life you gotta you know like put in the work study and make sure that you're surrounded with the, the right group of people. Miguel, I know you mentioned, um, you know, the importance of paper call, just piggybacking off of this topic here. But if we go like a, a level deeper when it comes to like paid ads on social media, what are like the specific verticals, whether it's within paper call or outside of it that you see like kind of work the best? Is it, you know, in the finance space, the insurance space, the education space, like from your experience, what do you see, you know, kind of returns the most on the ad when it comes to different verticals? So I would say like each vertical uh, will have its own ROI and it just depends on how much do you really know about the vertical and like how the vertical works and like really understanding your target audience and what are the the problems that these people needs to be solved. Uh, with that being said, uh, we are in 10 different verticals at the moment. Uh, we started with the insurances uh, because we felt like it was like the easiest one to start. Uh, we crushed our insurance for many years, uh, still crushing that one, uh, mostly on, on Q1 uh, because then uh, like all the buyers drops and all that stuff. Um, all the insurances for us has been like doing pretty well. Uh, but one of my favorite ones is, is the finance space, mortgage. Uh, with mortgage, I was able to make my first million dollars. And I was like, oh my God, like this is this is where I really wanted to tap into it. Uh, we do a lot of mortgage. Uh, nowadays, we do a lot of debt and loans. And I believe that 
the debt vertical is going to be one of the largest verticals within the next year because uh, the United States just hit $33 trillion on credit card debt. So that is like a really, really good amount uh, for us to help people, first of all, get rid of their debt and making sure that they can enroll in a program that can help their finances and, you know, like uh, they, you know, like finding a solution to the main problem that they have right now, which is they're racking up all these credit card debts and they don't have the money to pay like all this interest. So on our side, uh, last year we focused a lot on the debt space and the loan side too. Um, and other vehicles that, that we have been working for over two years is all the home improvement ones, uh, mostly solar. Uh, we do have our own our own solar company here as well uh, in Miami. We close deals in three states, uh, California, Florida, and Texas. Um, and yeah, I'll say those 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 three uh, categories. I'll say like uh, the insurances, the finances, and the home services are the vehicles that can bring you the best ROI. And in our experience, are the ones that, that we have had uh, the best success. Awesome. <clears throat> I was I was hoping Harrison would jump in with the next question. Well, no, I was, was, I was, I was going to say, uh, I actually did have a question, but I wasn't sure if you were going to jump in. Um, you know, do you think that w if you had to pick a vertical other outside of debt or there's a subcategory within these verticals, is there anything that's just underserved in the industry that you think is a huge opportunity for people? Um, I will say the, the real estate market um uh, the you know like buy buy home for cash right now um i know there is a huge opportunity down there uh we ourselves are working our on creating our our own uh offer uh for the real estate uh, market uh it's a great business model as well um and i believe that's that's that very cool that, that you're mentioning sure that's cool Miguel, something we talked about, you know, online before the episode was, you know, mental toughness related to the media buying space in general. Uh, I sure like, I'm sure on a surface level, everybody understands what, what you mean by that. But can you kind of go into the specifics of like, where do you need to be mentally tough in what, you know, parts of the process when it comes to social media paid ads? Yeah, it's like, like Adam was saying, you know, like, uh, the, the role of the media buyers, like doing the research, testing all the creatives and, and come up with the different ideas. And the tough part of social media and, and the platforms nowadays is that whenever you are starting it out, uh, you like you have so many little issues, right? Like your your fan page gets banned, uh, your profile gets banned, uh, your ads get rejected. Um, finally, when you have an ad that is approved, the calls or the CPMs or the CPCs are way too high. So as a media buyer, you're constantly, you know, like facing all these obstacles um, that I have trained more than 20 people and, and just the ones that have that mental clarity and that mental toughness are the one who sticks and have the real results because it's not an easy thing. Like most of the people will see the, the job and it's like, oh yes, I want to make all this money and it looks so easy. You're working behind your computer. It seems like that you are playing games or stuff like that. But the reality is that you're facing like all these obstacles day in and day out, day in and day out. And even when you're scaling your campaigns, that's, uh, I mean, right now when, when, when I'm scaling campaigns or like we're passing the six figure threshold, that's where I'm like, kind of like paranoid looking what, what is going to happen, you know, like where it's going to come. Because if I feel like if you prepare for the worst case scenario, when it comes, you're already prepared and you're able to give the best solution to the problem. So it's just a matter of like understanding and knowing that you're going to face challenge every single day of your life. And it's pretty much like life, you know? So that's why like mental toughness is, is something that, we do care a lot in our co company culture and we just want to make sure that, that all the persons that come uh, to the position as a media buyer understand that, that, hey, it's not going to be an easy thing. You got to be resilient. You got to be willing to put in the work and know that maybe the first week or the first month, you're not going to be profitable. 
but it's like if you never quit, you know, you're never gonna lose. Twenty million dollars a year as a media buying company. How did you how'd you do that? Like what's the mindset that you have to have to achieve something like that from your experience? I'll say company culture and and not just having a cash cow machine, like I'll say uh, you really have to create a company. You really have to go out there and, and hire people that are much better than you at some things because you don't know at all. And if you if you put yourself like high goals and, and you create this culture where everyone is executing at a really, really high level and creating like communication lines between all the team members, uh, that's that's where I feel like you can get to to that uh, sweet spot of, of creating, you know, like anything that you might want, you know, like we just hit that goal last year and, and, and we saw it like when I told my team, it's like, okay, this is where we want to go. Uh, everyone's like, holy shit, like, how are we going to do that? Um, and also, it's just like from the leadership, from the leadership uh, team, uh, you got to make sure that everyone knows and have a breakdown on how to get to that number, right? So what we did is we, like, whenever we put our goal, in, our, our goal to ourselves is we reverse engineer from the offers, from the advertisers, from like how much money do we need to spend to get to our goal? And then looking at your metrics on a weekly basis. Like we have this culture where we look at the KPIs of each one of the roles of the company on a weekly basis. And if you are not performing on a weekly basis, this pretty much you're out of the company because we just want to make sure that we have like uh, high performance people, people that is willing to put in the work and people that is doing but it's willing to do whatever it takes to get to the goal. I think what you said there, one of the things, a lot of what you said is really important, but one of the things that really resonated with me is that people see what you're doing and they go, oh, this must be easy. You're sitting behind a computer, you're having fun. And I think the reality of what people see is they see the result. They see what happened 10 years after all the hard work. People come up to Harrison and I all the time and, they they say like wow what you've built so amazing and i think what they don't see is all the pain and the suffering the blood sweat and tears emotional turmoil the sleepless nights the worrying about how you're going to take care of all these people you're responsible for and the tough decisions you have to make and the problems you have to deal with on a daily basis and it really is a hell of an emotional investment to build any business I do think that affiliate marketing is one of the last places people can go and build a real business for themselves without any investment capital or uh, in anything at all, except for an internet connection anywhere in the world. And I love our industry for that. I think it's an incredible opportunity. But for you to do that, you have to put in an immense amount of work. And I think people don't realize how much work it actually takes and how competitive it is and essentially how many other people are out there trying to eat your lunch at all times. And so I caution anybody to think that affiliate marketing is easy money to realize that it's blood, sweat, and tears until you build something of value. And then it is real personal growth and still more blood, sweat, and tears to keep growing it and build it. And it's the same. It's on not the instant profits. Stuff. That's for sure. Oh God, no. And, and so many people money- think that it's like literally that, like, People assume, you know, from an outside look into this industry, they assume like, I'm going to go spend a hundred bucks on Google ads. I'm going to make $291 and I'm going to do that. (laughs) My first campaign out the gates. I can tell you that Adam and I have had many not profitable campaigns too. (laughs) Yeah. Even with the book campaign, you know what? I'll commit to sharing our progress on the book campaign as we do it on the show, Josh, we can do a little segment on it, but I haven't told Harrison what the burn budget is, but here, watch this. Harrison, how much money do you think we're going to lose on the book campaign before I figure it out? Oh, like 100, probably. 100. Thousand dollars? Not a hundred dollars, (laughs) yeah. I was like, give me the cheat code. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, like, I think that's the reality of CODB, yeah. 
Yes, Harrison's mindset is that is he he just literally was like, all right, I'm going to be comfortable burning a hundred thousand dollars to let Adam figure out how to run the book campaign and the funnel and the upsells and figure out how to do the whole thing. I don't think it'll actually take a hundred thousand dollars to break even, but I think some campaigns will break even, some will be profitable, some will work, some won't, and over time we'll spend a hundred thousand dollars really learning. I don't think it'll take that much for us to make progress. I think that the light on fire budget, the lose 100% of the value budget is probably going to be $10,000 just to really figure it out, dial it in. All the money we'll lose on creative building and uh, landing page building and contractors and team members and all this stuff we have to do to really figure it out. I think we'll literally light $10,000 on fire and then over time we'll spend a hundred really building it out. Um, but that's what it takes if you want to do a successful campaign. I I think yeah. it's just, yeah, it's so much work and you have to be prepared to lose money. And I think that's what people don't see. It's really a hard to the... grasp that when you look outside and you see these companies like, like yours. Like if I'm a new guy at Affiliate Summit, first time you're just killing it, Miguel. I'm going to assume I'm going to go run some ads and just kill it. But what they don't know is that when you first started rocket and rolling, you didn't just kill it. It takes time and yeah. time, to, time and money to scale and optimize and grow profitable campaigns. And one of the things that one of my biggest mentor like uh, taught me is like delay gratification, boy. Because like when I was starting this business, is delay gratification. Like, don't take the profits to your pocket. Just keep reinvesting the money in the business for the business. So the business can keep growing. One of the things that you mentioned, Adam, is like the beautiful thing about uh, the affiliate marketing industry is that if you are like smart enough to play with your money, you can, you know, like keep growing and keep growing and keep growing. And just, it's just a matter of once you make your first million, just not go out there and buy like Lambos and, you know, like bodies and stuff. It's just keep reinvesting in your money and in your company. And that's pretty much what we have done here. We're hundred percent bootstrap. We don't have debt with anyone. We don't have outside investors, just like all the profits that we, we get every single month to like all of the partners in our company, we reinvest 30% of our profits every single month, no matter what. You know, so that's something that has helped us a lot, too. Well, Miguel, I want to say thank you on behalf of Adam and Harrison for joining us on the Affiliate Marketing Show today for myself, Josh from OfferVault.com, Mr. Paper Call, Adam Young, as well as the industry legend, Harrison Gewurz, plus our very special guest, Miguel Chavez, COO of Ecomfy Lead. Let's make that paper. Let's make that dough. This was the Affiliate Marketing Show. We will see you next time.